read his, do you swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. So Paul has informed me they have a choreographed uh, jump chart. <laughs> and, uh, whenever you're ready to proceed, Paul, go take it away. Uh, okay. Yes, everything is uh, kind of meant to uh, be like a pit crew. Um, we do have seven presenters here. Again, uh, I'm Paul Benson. On my right is Cynthia Sports MD, uh, Brian Sexton MD, um, Celine Chowdhury, Laura Brooker, Bob Percy, and Laurel Ruggles. And each of us will take part in uh, different parts of the presentation. Um, so those are the people who will be presenting. And uh, with respect to hospital issues, we'll turn right now to Ryan Sexton, uh, who's director of our ER services. But I'll tell you, one of the hospital issues this year is uh, NVRH will have its first CEO in 32 years. So for the record, this is the 32nd time I've done this. <laughs> And it's always interesting. So, Brian, you're up. And we will greatly miss Paul. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, in the interest of time, I will keep my comments brief and to the point. Um, first, I'd like to say, and I'm going to stress this, we have a bed problem in the state and region. Um, it is far too often the case that critically ill patients requiring specialty care are refused by appropriate treatment facilities. Um, this is because of lacking bed or staff capability. Just last month, as a brief example, our emergency department had to transfer a patient two states over to Maine Medical Center in Portland, Maine, um, because our tertiary care facilities here were full. I find this um, unacceptable. The most common regularly lacking inpatient specialized care in our state is psychiatry. Um, and because of this lack of resource, there's often a significant delay um, in the transfer of emergency patients um, in psychiatric crisis to appropriate Vermont psychiatric treatment facilities. Specifically, these facilities cite lack of bed and staffing capabilities. And as a result of this, patients um, are housed at NVRH, psychiatric patients with critical psychiatric illness, sometimes for days awaiting this transfer. It's not a question of whether the transfer is appropriate, it's a question of capability in our state. Um, these patients require intensive care and a significant amount of resources to protect both the patient, other patients, and our staff. This is a huge challenge for NVRH. Um, also of note, uh, our volume of patients presenting with acute mental illness has increased on an average of 24 per month to 33 per month presenting to our emergency department over the past Year. Um, we have been cited by CMS, um, who notes concerns specifically with patient observer uh, level of training, restraint <laughs> applications, and the physical space restrictions of our nurse department layout. NVRH is invested in this population. Uh, we have taken significant steps to enhance the psych psychiatric care that we can offer, given those restraints. Um, Specifically, we have um, augmented our staffing by training, um, or in the process of training, all of our emergency staff in CPI, or critical prevention interventions um, and services. We have trained patient observers now, we're all medically trained. And we've been very, working very closely with our care management um, and security team to ensure safety. Cases are always reviewed as part of the QA and QI initiative. NVRH um, recognizes the importance of outpatient services, and we are fortunate to have Dr. Swartz now part of our team, um, focusing on improving psychi psychiatric treatment programs. At this point, um, again, in the interest of time, I'd like to transition to Celine Chaudhary, CNO, and Dr. Swartz um, to present some of the very uh, specific innovative initiatives uh, focused on treating mental health illness and reducing ED utilization in our community. Good afternoon, board. Um, just want to talk to you briefly about one of the initiatives that we're doing, which Dr. Sexton has just talked about. Uh, we have met as a team with other agencies, Northeast Kingdom and Human Services, and uh, Northern, Northern Counties, uh, with the intent of trying to reduce or uh, change the way we do mental health in uh, the Northeast Kingdom. 
And so one of the things we're doing is a two-phase approach. This coming year, what we'd like to do is have embedded mental health workers in the emergency department with the intent of trying to uh, direct <coughs> patients to the appropriate services as far as mental health is concerned and decrease medical utilization and decrease the use of a hospital, thus reducing the impact of healthcare dollars and improving the care that we're giving for our patients. And then the second approach is a model that we've seen in California where they've actually done uh, psychiatric and uh, mental health uh, urgent cares. And so that's what we're, we're, we're trying to do. Um, and so there is a detailed explanation with that, and I'm happy to share that with you, but for the sake of time, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you very much. So um, I've been at uh, NBRH since October 2017, not quite a year. I work 20 hours a week at the hospital, Monday through Thursday, and I'm available by phone seven days uh, per week to the inpatient and outpatient providers who might have questions, uh, urgent questions for me regarding the patients they're caring for in the moment. Um, so I'm working with MDRH to develop a collaborative care model in which mental health care is embedded in the primary care practices. And this model is based on the well-researched uh, national collaborative care model, which is both cost-effective and improves mental health care and access. Uh, the way we're beginning this sort of population-based approach in the outpatient setting to assessment and treatment of mental health in the primary care setting is to look at benzodiazepines prescribed um, within Kingdom Internal Medicine, which is one of the MVRH practices. Um, benzodiazepines, as you know, are a potential drug of abuse. Um, and I'm uh, talking with providers about the appropriate ways to prescribe it and the long-term adverse effects of benzodiazepine use in patients. Um, and so we've done, uh, through a practice-wide chart review of patients on long-term benzodiazepines, we hope to dig deeper into the patient's histories and determine the underlying problems that the benzos have been prescribed in, um, and to come up with different and safer treatment um, strategies to help with the underlying problem, thereby reducing the overall prescribing of these uh, medications. Now, um, in the statistics that I saw, we're not particular, we're not necessarily higher in the state, but we can always improve that. Um, the use of benzodiazepines can thereby reduce um, uh, risk for diversion and, and substance abuse. So that's an example of just a general um, uh, work within an outpatient practice. So my outpatient face-to-face -face patient work is a mostly a one-time consultation uh, work. So I see a new patient every day, or each of the four days that I'm there. On Mondays, I, I'm embedded in the pediatric clinic, seeing a child there. And on the other days, I see an adult uh, that comes from one of the MBRH primary care practices and also from women's wellness, which for some patients sort of functions as their main <coughs> medical home. Uh, my outpatient consultations are designed to help the primary care provider deliver the mental health care. For example, I might be referred to an adult with depression for whom several medications have already been tried and it's, there's not an improvement in symptoms. And so in my consultation, I have an hour and a half to meet with the patient, dig deeper into what the problems are. Um, and together with the patient, we um, formulate a better understanding of the nature of the problem and come up with new treatment strategies. That may include medications, activity, diet, supplements, and particular psychotherapeutic interventions that will help with their particular problem. Um, I do not myself do the ongoing psychiatric treatment, um, but I do spend in that consultation considerable time with the patient doing psychoeducation and, um, and help them go forward with the treatment. I write a detailed consultation note to the primary care doctor or nurse practitioner with my diagnostic impression and recommendations for them to go forward. The PCP can always contact me through the patient's medical chart or directly to my cell phone or face-to-face -face if they have any follow-up questions. Um, in an indirect way of help, sometimes primary care providers just um, contact me uh, about a patient and ask 
for advice and I can review the chart and give advice or if I feel like I am not able to give a good recommendation without seeing the patient face to face, I recommend they see me. And patients are easily getting in to see me within a month. It's not a long wait because I see them just once and keep the, keep the system moving. Um, so that's the outpatient part and on the inpatient <coughs> consultation part, I help the hospitalists manage primarily two types of patients. One are the patients admitted with a primary medical problem for which there's a significant mental health issue that's impacting the illness or the recovery from the illness. Um, and um, the other are for those patients who have a psychiatric issue but don't meet inpatient hospital level of care but are awaiting a placement in a long-term facility or a nursing home. So for the medical patient, if they're a MDRH primary care patient, I'm able to reach out to the primary care provider and improve the continuity of the mental health treatment from the inpatient setting back to their medical home. And this is usually in regards to medication changes that I might have helped advise the hospitalist to try, and I, I'll be in the background following that. Um, for patients awaiting long-term placement, I help um, assess and treat the patient's mental health problems just as though they were in the residential or nursing home setting. Commonly, I'm helping treat the behavioral um, problems associated with dementia, which cause significant disturbance on the general medical floor and stress to the nursing staff as well as to the patient. Um, and so my treatment recommendations include environmental adjustments and behavioral uh, interventions to reduce the need for acute medication interventions in this vulnerable population. So that's a very brief, a brief summary of the outpatient consultation work I do and the inpatient consultation work I do. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it for more questions from you. Thank you. Okay, so more on that. Good afternoon. So I'm going to talk about some of the risks and opportunities at MBRH, uh, starting with one of the biggest risks that we, uh, rural hospitals, most of the hospitals in Vermont are, as you know, is recruitment and retention of staff. Uh, right now, we have an opening for a general surgeon and uh, called an OBGYN physician, and 11 12 nursing vacancies, our nursing vacancies that we have to count this today, but a significant number of nursing positions are vacant as well. Of course, that is, is a risk to us. Uh, one of the other risks is any change to the 340B program. It is talked about frequently, changes are, are contemplated. Uh, the 340B program to NVRH is worth about $3.2 million a year between what we save in the drugs for our patients and what the retail pharmacy piece of the 340B business <coughs> is. So any change to the 340B program is a huge risk to us. Uh, we are in a fairly good position of being busy. Patients are not driving by NBRH anymore. Uh, we have strengthened a number of services at the hospital, uh, ED, uh, neurology, neurology, uh, orthopedics we've talked about before. Uh, and so we're seeing more patients uh, in the hospital, uh, and the concern, of course, is that that is causing, in part, our uh, revenue growth above the 3.2%. Uh, we were recently made aware that our competitor in Littleton uh, was trying to get into uh, Vermont and acquire a physical therapy practice, I'm sure with the intent of putting an orthopedic surgeon in our backyard, which is a threat to us. Uh, we are also now going to be pursuing that, that practice as well. Uh, we've talked about some of the new services and programs uh, for patients with mental health and substance use disorder, diagnoses, um, those are opportunities. Uh, we continue to look for lean-like opportunities to improve efficiencies uh, and to improve the, the patient experience. And we can elaborate that further if you'd like. Uh, we are looking at an alternative to the one cure model uh, that fits with our uh, vision for our Capital Health community. We'll get into that and put a bit more detail later on in the presentation. Uh, and we're looking at the opportunity to join One Care with some of their other projects as well. We're still in the evaluation process for that. 
But I'll turn it over to Laura Brooker to talk about some of the access time. Good afternoon. Um, in, in the interest of time, I've chosen to highlight four areas, um, two where we're doing rather well, and two where we're struggling a bit. Our primary care access has increased. We've been able to recruit a number of primary care physicians, and we're currently fully staffed with primary care physicians. So our access times are one week for a well check and two days maximum for an acute visit. Um, pediatrics. Pediatrics, we've rarely been struggling with um, finding a pediatrician to replace a pediatrician that left you last fall. So unfortunately, with that access issue, um, we're at about 11 weeks for a well child check and one week for an acute visit. Generally, they get those patients in the day that they need to be seen, but they have to do that with overbooking and the other things that go with staying late, working through lunch, etc. Cardiology is a service that we contract um, with CBNC, uh, and with their inability to also recruit cardio a cardiologists that replaced the cardiologist that left, we're really struggling in this area. Um, it's taking us about four months to see a new cardiology patient and three months for a follow-up visit. So that's been really tough on our community. Um, palliative care, on the other hand, we're doing really well. Uh, both of our palliative care physicians are super busy. Um, and we can get those patients in generally in with one week. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the quality measures. Uh, I chose to highlight the HbA1c measure. Um, both of our primary care practices, Corner Medical and Kingdom Internal Medicine, are participating in the statewide diabetes collaborative. Um, and they've actually chosen this measure to focus on in that collaborative. Um, we've got physicians working in that group. Uh, we've got an ambulatory pharmacist that's helping with the project, behavioral health nurses, care coordinators. So we've got a large group that's working on that right now. Um, the 30-day follow-up discharge for mental health or alcohol substance use disorder dependence treatment. This is a measure that we actually had not been tracking. Um, we did really well with tracking um, when patients were discharged from inpatient or discharged from the ER. We had a really good follow-up system in place. Um, we do a great job of following up with the mental health or alcohol substance use disorder patients if we know about them. When we saw this measure, it, we realized that this wasn't something that we were looking at closely enough, so we reached out to Valley Vista, Red Borough Retreat, to collaborate with them more. Um, we've already had a representative come up and meet with us from Valley Vista to try to improve this process. Um, the percentage of reported PCPs, this has historically been a really good number in our area, but uh, has increased even further with the collaboration and support of our care managers within our ED. They've done a really great job of working with our PCPs and getting people signed up for PCPs. Thank you, Laura. I'll talk about our financial performance. I've reproduced uh, several schedules here uh, for reference. Um, our operating margin is going to be about 1.7 percent. Uh, internal, we've targeted a 1.5 to 2 and a quarter, 2 and a half percent operating margin to achieve every year, and so we're within our, our target range for what we consider to be long-term financial health of the hospital. Uh, our bottom line, as you can see, about 1.4 million is very consistent uh, from year to year, and that's what we're uh, hoping to maintain going forward. Again, it's about 1.4 million, 1.5 million bottom line, and, and again, about one and three quarters percent or so, uh, as a percent of uh, revenue operating margin. Uh, I've highlighted some of the key changes from year to year. Uh, I will, will highlight again, we talked about our nursing vacancy position. We, put in extra salaries in the budget uh, to help uh, us can remain competitive for nurses and other health professionals. But again, with the 11 or 12 nursing vacancies we're focused on being competitive, we found that we were lacking a bit and we're taking steps to correct that and get market competitive again uh, for those key employees. Um, I will also highlight the fact that uh, from since, since 2017, our disproportionate share budget has gone down by over $600,000. Well, the provider taxes have gone up a bit. Uh, looking at our balance sheet, um, I just highlight our base cash on hand at about 122. 
uh, slightly higher than, our, higher than our peer group margin, uh, lower from all the provide benchmark, but if you focus on the critical access peer group, we're just a little bit higher than, than our peers. Um, the tech service coverage ratio looks like it's going down significantly, but in fact, it's just the temporary borrowing that we have on the level of books at the uh, end of 2019. Uh, we're planning to borrow some, 120 billion or so. We've got several capital projects that are hitting all at once. Uh, we just did our birth center. We're upgrading our computer system. Uh, and we'll be putting in a new MRI. So we have a one-year crunch where we're going to borrow internally or borrow from a, a bank for some short-term uh, needs and then pay it back in 2020. So that's what's affecting the debt service coverage ratio. Looking over to page five, again, it's the, uh, you can see the cash flow statement where I included that 1.8 million of, of, of borrowing. Our capital budget is about 6.9 million. Uh, that includes the 3.1 for the MRI uh, replacement projects, a uh, project that was recently approved uh, by the Greenland Care Board. We were asked to provide information on our in-state versus out-of-state payer mix, uh, and that information is provided here. Uh, roughly five and a quarter percent of our total uh, revenue uh, is from out-of-state. So you can see it's about eight, almost eight million one hundred fifty thousand uh, out of our one million five hundred fifty-seven million one hundred fifty-seven million dollars. <clears throat> we talked about some of the expense drivers and our cost containment efforts. Um, the drivers are here. I don't think I need to repeat them all in the interest of time. You can read them. Um, our cost containment efforts again, maximizing the three forty B program. There's a huge benefit to us, and it's well over $800,000 at this point. <clears throat> we provided a reconciliation of our 19, fiscal 18 budget to projected. Uh, that was part of our original budget submission. Um, it's in here again, uh, and again, I would highlight the increase in the 340B revenue, uh, which continues to grow. It's $676,000 dollars of the estimated increase, partially from having additional providers and partially some education of our providers on the 340B program and, and uh, how it can be beneficial to the hospital and to the patients. The last thing I want to talk on is page 7, uh, the additional clarifying information uh, to tell the hospital story is, uh, I won't go through with all the calculus here, uh, but as you can see, we presented our version of a roll forward from fiscal 18 to fiscal 19 that shows that our net patient revenue would actually be under the 3.2% cap by about $114,000. And I, that's all I wanted to cover on our financial highlights. I'd be happy to answer questions in a few minutes. I'll turn it over to Laurel Ruggles. So my change my parking lot further than I thought. Um, so we, we like to engage with our community on an ongoing basis, but every three years we do a formal community health needs assessment. Um, I brought some copies for um, the board and a few other people, but it's also the one for 2018, so this is our year again to, to do a formal one. It's also on the hospital webpage and your shower if people want to see it. The implementation plan, which is a comp companion piece to the community health needs assessment, is still in draft form because it needs to be adopted by our board of trustees, and we hope that they do that next week at their August board meeting. So I think to summarize our community health needs assessment, we, we can't do it alone. We work really closely with our community partners. Uh, whether it's getting data from Vermont Department of Health, we use the new community profile um, information from AHS on their website this year, uh, Council on Aging and our community action organization. We're really instrumental in connecting us to people in our vulnerable population like older Vermonters and low-income families. And so that's, we, we, we work with people in the community, uh, residents, uh, people who 
work, provide services, work professionally with people, and then also make those people who live in our community. And that's how we get the information that we need. So I wanted to, because when we're talking to people, we're always, we're always looking for solutions, not just the problems and identifying the needs and the gaps. So I wanted to just tell you one little um, piece of information that we used in order to come up with what I think was a pretty innovative solution that you'll, you'll find on our implementation plan. So this problem was first identified by Mary Grant, who is the CEO of our rural transportation, rural community transportation organization, RCT, who do a, they do a super job with providing public transportation in our region. But what she said one day was, you know where the real area, where the real gap is, is, is in providing transportation to people to work. Particularly if they are working an evening shift or a weekend shift or a night shift, so to be able to use their services. So we went to the Reach Out program, which is the state program to prepare people readiness for work, and they confirmed that with us. They said, you know, we can, we don't have that much of a problem getting to medical appointments, to other essential services, even to things like shopping, but if you don't have a car, it's really hard to get to work. So to help figure out what's the best solution to that, I went and talked to some people in our book rehab office, Melissa and Todd. I said, what are you seeing? What's working? What's not working? And they said, you know, Norm, if we can find transportation, if we can arrange transportation for somebody for the first month, month or two, maybe in the first few weeks of their job, then they can figure it out. They find out that there's someone who lives near there that they can carpool with, or they find out that there is a bus route that they can take, or now they're working, so they can afford to get the car fixed that has been broken, or they can afford to buy a car now that they're working. So they said, that's what, if we can get them there, and get them started and get them successful in their job, they figure it out. But they don't always have the resources, they don't have the money to do that. And so I said, well, that's where the hospital can come in. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with our next fiscal year. We haven't worked out the logistics yet. I'm not sure if we're going to set up an account with RCT or an account at Enterprise Rental Car, or we'll figure out how we're going to do it logistically. But we're going to track it. We're going to see how successful it is, and I can report on it again for you next year. Thank you. I'll next uh, highlight some of the healthcare reform, reform investment uh, programs that we've implemented in the past few years. Uh, one is the ambulatory pharmacist. Uh, done a tremendous job for patients, uh, front, uh, working with several of our primary care practices. Uh, you heard Laura talk a little bit about what he's doing with diabetes patients. Uh, in general, uh, he has done a lot to uh, manage, help patients manage their medications better, thereby reducing uh, avoidable admissions to the ED or inpatient services. Our Caledonia Essex Accountable Health Community, you've heard a lot about. Uh, I think this is the third or fourth year we've talked about it. We're going to talk about it again as part of our uh, future, look at the future of financial uh, outlook for the hospital. Our ED managers, uh, we've actually had to increase from one to 1.4 full-time equivalent care managers uh, working in the ED. Uh, they do a tremendous job of referring patients who present in our ED uh, who need to connect with other resources in the community, not only to primary care, uh, but to any other health service organization in the community. They uh, do a great job, and Dr. Ryan can a minute to elaborate on some of that as well. Uh, we have one and a quarter palliative care, board certified palliative care physicians in the community. Uh, we're just uh, partnering with Northern County's health care. We're going to add another 0.5 nurse practitioner uh, to our palliative care service as well. Uh, tremendous program, uh, tremendously busy, and we're putting resources into it to meet the community need. Uh, our part time psychiatrist, Dr. Swartz, you, you already heard from, so I don't need to elaborate on that any further. Uh, and we're getting ready to implement the community paramedic service as well, and Dr. Sexton will touch on that also. Just briefly, in terms of our ED care management program, this is a program that we developed um, when I came on board uh, three years ago, and it has grown um, with the support um, from the administration. Uh, huge success. Um, these care managers not only 
helping patients um, uh, schedule follow-up appointments um, after being seen in the emergency department, uh, both with primary care and specialty care, um, and kind of navigating that, communicating with care managers in the primary care practices. Um, but also, um, we, we have them focused on very specific initiatives, uh, with what I like to term as um, trying to best provide care to the medically underserved. So looking at um, high utilizers of the emergency department, trying to focus in resources on them. Um, and we're working uh, as part of a, a care transitions team, which is multidisciplinary um, within the system, including primary care offices, uh, inpatient, um, and ED, to identify those patients who uh, most need services. Regarding the community paramedics um, service, um, uh, also um, termed uh, integrated mobile health care program, um, it's currently um, in, in the works. There have been a few delays just in terms of training. We are working closely with our EMS partner, um, uh, Calix EMS, um, uh, to develop training of the paramedics. The target population for this program specifically are, are patients who have presented to the emergency department and are discharged from the ED or if they are um, inpatient um, with a diagnosis of COPD, CHF, um, or elderly who have a fall. Um, and the goal with those target populations is that um, we're gonna transition those patients to outpatient services um, uh, more seamlessly, specifically looking at metrics to reduce um, post-discharge uh, term failures, looking at ED utilization after that discharge, um, ensuring PCP follow-up, those are the kind of metrics we're looking at. The paramedics will be tasked with um, uh, mainly medication compliance, um, also fall prevention and fall assessment in the home, um, uh, and also identifying any restriction, uh, restrictions to care, um, whether that be transportation or the like, and then communicating that back to uh, care management within the practice. Uh, moving next to our capital budget plans. Um, a couple of points, uh, routine, ongoing capital needs are about $2.4 million. Uh, infrastructure, you know, the facility was built in 1972. We continue to upgrade with the infrastructure. So we're planning on about $500,000 for the HVAC systems, electrical systems, etc., cetera, to, to keep the infrastructure current. Um, routine technical uh, technology replacement, uh, for example, next year we're planning to move our Outlook uh, email system uh, to Outlook 365, new technology. Great service. Our current system is at risk with the service based uh, that we have the aging, and uh, we're looking to go to the Outlook 365, a new investment for us. And our current birth center, the electronic health record, is not linked to Meditech. <coughs> it's through a separate uh, system, centricity by name. Uh, and it's difficult for our providers to jump back and forth between systems. So we're able now to get our birth center system integrated into the rest of the Meditech system. And what you see here at the 3.8 million roughly does not include the MRI. Uh, this is non CL1 spending only. So as I mentioned before, we're going to spend about 3.1 million for the recently approved uh, MRI certificate of need project. A long range financial outlook, we're going to have Laurel and Paul talk a lot about this. Uh, what we're seeing is the future for Healthcare financing. Um, you could call it alignment or you can kind of call it overlaying the kind of the whole community. 
on top of the kind of care organization model. Do you want to add anything, Paul? Sure. Um, well, I've, I've been involved with um, the all-payer model uh, like work for uh, actually right from the beginning. Um, and in some ways before, again, we're, we're interested in taking on risk, but, but again, my interest has always been on uh, integrating services, uh, and not just uh, medical services with medical services across clinics and things like that, but they integrate uh, 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 services uh, across uh, most of the human services because what I uh, saw when I, uh, living in the Northeast Kingdom is many of these different agencies are working with uh, common clients and uh, we're not working in the most coordinated way. Uh, the ACO concept is one step in my mind in, in the direction, the right direction to uh, integrate care, but the accountable health community is one uh, that has always fascinated uh, me for a whole variety of reasons. But I don't think, my own personal opinion is uh, the, uh, is, is, is we look out to the future, we're really not doing health reform if we're just working on what I call stuff. And you, you might consider this a rather crude opinion, but uh, yeah, we can talk about telehealth, we can talk about this, that, and the other, but uh, what really impresses me is when uh, the accountable health community people, that means the community action groups, the councils on aging, the mental health system, by the way, I'm a trustee at the designated agency, so uh, I'm aware of a lot of uh, uh, frontline things that can be done. Um, and also then with the uh, uh, medical system and uh, with the, the housing people and the food security people and the economic uh, uh, security people. And by the way, the, uh, Tanya Kristen is out here uh, observing this, but uh, the Green Mountain uh, United Way is a key player too. People don't really think of this uh, generally speaking, as part of the team uh, that can really focus, find synergy, and solve some of the problems that we face. Uh, the ideas that we have, uh, at least I've had uh, for quite some time, could, um, I think, align very well with the alternative uh, payment model. And I think we've referred in past years to terms like lending and grading and funding. So uh, for the first time in quite some time, I'm actually thrilled that uh, we're having innovative conversations with the Department of Vermont Health Access. Michael Acosta is coming out to visit with us tomorrow on some innovative payment alternatives that we could put in place uh, with the Medicaid population. Uh, in our area, and I'm talking about geographic population, not just attributed population. Um, and I think we'd be looking for some of those uh, innovative relationships that Laurel referred to that are happening uh, reasonably well in certain pockets, pockets of the country, uh, say out in the state of Washington. But um, uh, to be blunt, I find the uh, ACO model that we have right now, the contracts that we have uh, in place, uh, they're, uh, they're too constraining, in my opinion, and uh, I'm not, they'll maybe get us to where we need to go five, ten years out from now. But I think there are some things that we could do now. I think a lot of innovation happens locally. Uh, I'm aware of the global agreement that the state has with CMS. I've actually read the thing. And um, actually, section one, item one reads uh, about statewideness. It says, uh, to the extent possible, this needs to work differently in different parts of the state. So when I hear somebody, and, and we give people an idea, and I hear the word can't, um, that's not really part of how I think. So um, the financing of healthcare is always going to be risky. It can't possibly not be risky when it's, uh, much of the Medicaid population is 
uh, supported by finances that are less than the cost of those services. So um, rather than uh, take up uh, the rest of our, our time giving my homily, um, I'll stop. <laughs> And I'll study it. Uh, the last section. Uh, the last section we were asked to address is our compliance with the uh, budget orders for the past uh, few years. Uh, you can see our track record has varied. Um, the big year of 2016 was the first year we had to be rebased because of all the business, orthopedic business we were bringing back to Vermont from the Hampshire hospitals. That rebasing did happen the next year in 2017. Uh, you can see we came in under the 2017 approved budget. By 2018, based on the standard calculation, it looks like it's going to be over by about $700,000. But if we go back to the alternative calculation that I went through and talked about earlier, we're actually under the 2018 cap at about $252,000. So that's our historical compliance. And with that, our presentation is ended. And we'll turn it over for questions. Great. Thank you very much. Starting with board member Robin, thank you much. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's good to see you all again. And I was. Uh, very interested to hear your update around the Accountable Community for Health and also very uh, pleased to see that you're continuing to move forward, including uh, by working through uh, the existing ACO program. Because I, I, I hear you, Paul, that Kant isn't in your, knowing you for as long as I've known you at this point, I know Kant isn't in your vocabulary. And all I can say to that is I'm glad I'm not your general counsel. <laughs> see that you're moving forward. Um, the, one of the questions that I had for you related to your health care reform investments is um, in terms of your expansion of your palliative care, your physician time and your pal palliative care organization, are there any specific disease conditions that you're going to target through that program expansion or um, just is it a general expansion? Right. Oh. Well, uh, we, we work very closely with the Norris Cancer Center North, so uh, they, they work, uh, you know, our palliative care physicians, there are actually two of them, it's not like there's one and one quarter bodies out there, they're both board certified uh, palliative care uh, uh, physicians, they uh, do have co-employment by, uh, by the hospital and the FQHC, for example, one is the hospice director, so um, there is a continuity between the palliative care program and the hospice program, uh, but the referral, referrals come directly from the community, the cancer center, uh, the physician offices, and I assume even from the ER. Um, um, I don't know if there are others. Yeah, and the, and the inpatient service. Um, and um, it's, it is an expanding uh, program. Great, thank you. I just was curious about that. Um, another question I had around the ACO dues um, or investment in your new LLC, if the, if, because I, it looked like from the uh, materials that it was an either or, if you were, which ma makes me think that perhaps you're not 100% yet on signing on the dotted line with one care. Um, so, if I'm wrong about that, I'd love to hear that. Um, but the, the question I had is, if you allocate it to the LLC, how would you propose to report on how these funds are spent and how the investment uh, more specifically relates to the state's health care reform goals? Uh, well, the short answer is, uh, well, for starters, we'll take it in layers. Uh, yes, there is, we're uncertain about signing um, the, the document with uh, One Care Vermont as it exists now. Uh, in terms of uh, one of my um, 
uh, opinions over time has always been because we we started a lot of this work back before uh, One Care Vermont even existed. Uh, we were working on this regionally. We already had systems in place uh, that are functional uh, and, and working reasonably well given the constraints that we have in our area, which are primarily, frankly, economic. Uh, there are things uh, related to uh, the rural nature of the area, but uh, so um, we already had systems in place, investments that we've already made. Uh, my thing is, uh, wh why should this region of the state be paying a fee uh, to an organization that is not going to add value to what we do? Now, that sounds like a very rude thing to say, but I have, I'm still trying to figure out how uh, paying, for example, next year. I know there, it said there's no fee, but if you get into the nitty gritty of some of these uh, ag agreement sections, uh, there is a withhold. And uh, as far as I understand from the map, uh, there, there is something, yeah, it's not called a fee, it's not called a tax, but it still involves uh, 300 uh, plus thousands of dollars invested in additional bureaucracy, in my opinion, to what we already have in place. So I'm happy to work with people. I think that we're much more knowledgeable, knowledgeable about where to invest the money. Um, the money, um, basically, you can see part of it uh, figured into uh, our very um, uh, like getting our toe in the water sort of investments in the budget that are related to our uh, community health needs assessment implementation plan. And we put uh, our money uh, our, uh, where our mouth is over the past number of years. Say, for example, um, Dr. Swartz is not, she was not included in our budget for uh, the coming, you know, for the year that we're in right now. But it would be pretty stupid of me to uh, pass up the opportunity of getting something, uh, a skill and a person who's absolutely wonderful, who we've never had access uh, to before, uh, to come work with us on our team, uh, a person who actually knows how to build systems, you know, with uh, other systems people. So uh, we're, we're investing literally hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in uh, mental health related programs as you've heard today. We're also dealing with some of the, um, what I would call backwash of uh, things that are happening in the rest of the, um, the, the mental health non-system out there right now. In fact, uh, you may have recalled I've been a crank pretty much all my professional life about uh, the issue of spending way too much time focusing on inpatient beds rather than figuring out, I mean, we're doing workarounds with the symptoms. We're not dealing, in my opinion, uh, with, with what's causing all this stuff in the first place. And there are many things that I can see we could be doing with our designated agency to strengthen uh, frontline operations, both in terms of system building so that uh, patients who want to get into the designated agency services don't have to get clogged up in the service because we've got people in their service who could be better served in the primary care of medical home. So there are a lot of options out there in terms of how to spend that money better, and by the way, not waste a lot of money, which I personally think we're doing. Um, as a state. Um, so um, we, I'd be happy to report on a monthly basis, here's what, here's what we're seeing, and here are the kinds of improvements that, uh, that we uh, can expect. Uh, one of the, I'll stop with that, because I, I, this is a favorite topic of mine. <laughs> <laughs> the shorter answer, right, I think, is it, it also, <laughs> It also speaks to, we have a commitment in the Canada Health Community Model. So we wanted you know, to get that in our budget. As I, as I think many people at the state level will do as well, but we're going to be starting the third round of the Canada Health Community Care Learning Labs that are, you know, that started with the State Innovation Model Grant, and then we've done it, so we the second time without really having any of that state money that so the, the state's put in there putting some resources into this as well, which is really encouraging to us. We, want to, we just want to be ready when, when everybody else is. So I guess just in follow-up to that, I would say, first of all, I always appreciate your bluntness, bluntness, Paul, and I feel like it allows me to return bluntness back, which is 
Uh, I know where the, if I know through our accountable care organization review, budget review process where the withhold money goes and, and the kinds of payments it is used for it basically to quite frankly shift dollars from the hospital sector to the primary care sector. I don't know based on your description what the $200,000 would be used for for the LLC. So before I'm willing to approve it for that purpose, I would need to know uh, with more specificity the use of those funds. So I'll just put that out there for your information. Um, uh, well, we, we, can, we can respond with specifics. That would be great. Um, moving on to uh, the rate increase of 4%. Uh, I just had a couple questions around uh, your commercial contracts. Are the majority of your commercial payer contracts uh, percentage of charges? I would assume yes. Um, yes. And then uh, what are your primary commercial payers? Uh, Blue Cross is the most, uh, the, the largest commercial payer that we have, uh, okay. followed by uh, a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit of signal. Great. All right. Thank you. Those are my questions. Well, I don't have any questions. I thought the presentation was pretty straightforward. Um, you know, looking at your NPR projections and your expense projections are all inside your recent year trends. Um, and uh, you know, take you to a bottom line that is reflective of where you've been over the last few years. Um, so I have maybe three quick questions. I, I am curious always as to how people project their Medicaid NPR increase in your six tenths of one percent. Um, how, does, how, how do you get to that number? Uh, the increase of the Medicaid is basically just a little bit of volume growth. Uh, we're not projecting any rate increases at all. Right, I saw that. So you have no rate increase income in either Medicare or Medicaid. The rate increase doesn't affect Medicare or Medicaid. Right, that's right. I can, I can see that. I mean, just six tenths of one percent, but it just seems like such a fine tuned number that. Uh, uh, that's pretty much consistent with our volume growth. Okay. And then just the other two things are uh, looking at um, the reconciliation. Uh, for other operating income on page 12. Um, you don't have to look at it now, just to, to, to double check, is that um, there you have um, a, a number of 3.7 million, and in the uh, staff analysis document, uh, the total other operating income is 3.44 million. So I think there's some noise there some, somewhere um, that uh, uh, might need to be corrected. And the only other question was, <clears throat> looking at um, the 340B growth, um, uh, last year in the budget you had it at 1.5 million, and uh, now you're running at about 2.2 million, and projecting 2.4 million uh, for 2019 um, is so that that was a big jump from budget to budget, uh, and I'm just curious as to what might be behind that. Uh, so part of it is getting new more providers into the program to be more providers that are eligible. Uh, those of education with the providers on the drugs that are eligible um, for the 340B versus those that aren't eligible for the 340B. It will make no difference for the patients, uh, either the cost or outcome, uh, having to go to the 340B eligible point. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I, I have a, I have some disconnects between your revenue growth and your expense growth. So when we look in 2019 for the budget, um, your revenue is growing uh, NPR 3.8 million, and rate is about million four of that, and your expenses are growing 4.6 million. So, you know, at first there's a little bit of a disconnect on how high your expenses are growing in 2019. And I guess to step back a second, I kind of want you to help me get to a 3.2% increase, increase rather than the 5% that you have. Um, because I look at you guys as you were like ahead of your time. You got rebased from 16 and 17. You were up 6% in 16, you were up 7% in 17. You got what you wanted in 18, which when you came in here was over an 11% increase off of budget to budget. And, um, you know, you, we gave you what you wanted last year. So, I, so the 
revisionist to kind of look at it as, as a 5% is, is a re redefined, you know, equals the 3.2%, I, I don't buy into that. So I really want to see, you know, how do we get you back to a 3.2% and, you know, taking your rate away gets us right there to a 3.2. Um, but I think, you know, in that expense area, there has to be some more cost savings or other things you can do because the <coughs> increase in 2019 is more than your revenue increase and is significant over the prior year. That's correct. And, and it's made up by the increase in the 340B program. That's how we're closing that gap. But to get to your, your question about expense growth, I mean, we are constantly looking at expenses. Uh, some of our expense growth is Again, to the market competitive wages are going to have to do over and above general cost of living increases. Uh, part of the additional costs that we've had to incur uh, to comply with CMS regulations on how we're caring for patients in the hospital, in ED and in the hospital, uh, for patients with mental abuse and substance abuse disorders. Um, those are some of the cost drivers over and above the general inflation. Right, because I think even the general inflation, you have about 1.6 million in for general inflation. I mean, we're, you know, we're looking for about a million and a half, right? Mm -hmm. It's about what we're going to have to, to try to get back if, this is just one person, but if we were going to the 3.2%, because mm -hmm. you, know, you um, guys are clearly above what the guidance was. Uh, we can walk through the detailed calculus if you'd like to. Or, um... it's, it seems to be in... You know, in most all your lines, right? So salaries are going from 27.4 to 29 million, fringe 8.5 to 9 million, physician fees 9.5 to 10.4. I mean, all of your lines, um, other operating 22.7 to 23.6. So, I mean, I don't doubt that you have expenses in there, but when you look at your utilization, you're only showing, you're showing an under 2% utilization growth. So the utilization is only a couple million dollars and your expense growth is 4.6 million. So I think you guys may need to look at additional cost savings in order to well, get mean, to the lower number. Yeah, I mean, it's almost the time now, but we <laughs> looked at additional cost savings throughout the process, and this is the budget that, uh, given all the challenges that we're facing, uh, is the best to meet the needs of our community. Yeah, so we'll, just, we'll take another look at it. But, right. Well, I mean, it's, 17, you had a 77.4 million. Your 18 budget was 78.6. Your 18 projection is 79.8. And now your 19 budget is 83.2. So there's a schedule in here that does walk through those increases from year to year. I mean, it's, and I can challenge whether 2%, you know, whether 2% inflation across everything, which was giving you 1.6, and then you have salaries and other things. I just, I just think. You know, I'm just trying to put out there that there may need to be additional cost savings or something to bridge a gap well, you know, in order to get to, and how do we get to a 3.2%? Uh, yeah, there, there's probably uh, upwards of between four and $500,000 that uh, uh, are not bringing any new revenue in related to addressing some of the mental health related issues that show up at our doors. Um, and, and in fact, uh, uh, I've met with some of our uh, legislators talking about our concerns that uh, there's a gap between uh, what the regulatory requirement uh, agencies are requiring of us and what, I, uh, what we think uh, we should need to uh, provide to uh, people arriving at our doors uh, with mental health service needs. So um, I wouldn't mind saving uh, 400 to plus thousands of dollars. I don't think I'm off on that. Uh, number uh, because you know what I don't think it's going to add a bit of value uh, and improve uh, health care outcomes at all I'd love to do that but we're we're not going to be allowed to do that no matter how what what you say we're going to have to spend that money we've been told by the government thanks okay just my turn all right um, so I, I guess I'm just going to echo a little bit of my colleague Maureen's point that you know our our budget guidance is at 2.8 with a 0.4 for you know health reform investments. You're coming in at five, obviously well above our guidance, um, which means we probably all have a little bit of work to do here. And I just want to point out your um, the 
alternative way of looking at our at your NPR. Um, I think it's on page seven of your presentation. That's where. Yeah. So I, and we don't have to go through this right now, step by step. But there's a couple of things that I think need to be reconsidered. Um, if you look at the fiscal year 2018 base that you used, uh, it doesn't align with actually what we approved, the rebasing in fiscal year 2018, according to our budget guidance that was submitted you know, in September, uh, in January. Um, I understand, so that, that's, and that's off by about 800,000. Um, the cardiology transfer, I understand that you're, uh, it had been approved for partial year and you're upping it for the full year. Totally appreciate that, even with that adjustment and the lab transfer adjustment. Fine. So our, the final base that I would come up with would be different than the final base that you would come up with based on what you're using as the fiscal year 18 base. I'm using what the board approved as the rebased fiscal year 18 uh, base. Uh, then the second layer I think that just deserves some reconsideration is the improved growth rate for 2018-19 is actually 2.8. It's not 3.2. 3.2 is inclusive of health reform investments. 2.8 is the growth rate that we allow for the base, so that the subsequent additions that you have down there may or may not be considered as health reform investments and could be in the point four or not, but you, I, I would just caution to say those are not definite add-ons, add and the 3.2 is inclusive of approved health reform investments. So, I just so to can I uh, address your questions? Yes, you certainly can. I'd love to. So you're right. The 2018 base that you're talking about is not always approved. It's taking what we were allowed in 2017 and rolling that number forward. That's a big difference. Right. If we under uh, produced revenue in 2017, so the, the big change is rolling the. Uh, but I think it's only, that's revisionist history, right? Is to say, well, if you had approved that and given us 3.4 on top of the rebasing, but actually, if you take the rebase that we actually gave you in fiscal year 2018 and go from there, the answer is no. Right. You, you rebase 2017 would roll that forward. What I'm saying is, if we rolled forward, we could have had it 17. I understand. The okay. I'm just saying how I got to the number. Got it. Okay. The second part of it is the, the 2018 to 19 growth rate. Uh, we've identified other healthcare reform investments that do add up to the 0.4%. Um, one is the ACO fees and the other is the additional value of care. So then what we've shown here down the bottom, the recovery coaches and mental health ED phase one. Uh, when the Green Mountain Care Board representatives came to visit us in April, uh, we made the point we wanted to invest money that they put us over the cap in new services. And we were told, go for it, make your arguments, and put it in the budget. So that's what we have. That's over and above the 0.4% for the um, healthcare reform investments. Okay. Um, the other thing that I'd like to ask about is, um, you know, um, Non-operating revenue. I just noticed that you, I, I believe, are the only hospital that has reports no zero non-operating revenue. I wonder if you could speak to that. Sure. Most of our non-operating revenue is um, unrealized gains and losses on stocks and our investments. Um, I, I can't tell you what the stock market's going to do next year and whether we're going to have unrealized gains or losses. So we just pledge a zero. Okay. Well, you're the only hospital to do that, so I thought I was surprised by that. Uh, you know, I'll have to talk to my peers, because they have a crystal ball that I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then one of your health reform investments involves the palliative care program expanding it, and I know that was a part of the 2017 uh, health reform investment. So I'm wondering if you can speak to one of the reasons the justification back then, I think it's a very legitimate one, is that it was going to reduce ED visits and other service visits. And I'm wondering if you have been able to quantify the impact that it's had in the last two years? I, we, we're, not, we're putting the data together, but we've not been able to get anything that I can present to you and yeah. within your life. Okay, great. I think those are my questions. Yeah. Thank you. So the questions that Glenn had asked have been asked and answered, but I have a couple of new ones since uh, I've listened to the presentation. First of all, you talked about the purchase of a PT practice. And I'm curious uh, about that as far as um, you, you currently have your own employee PTs, correct? Correct. Okay. So um, when you're referring out 
after somebody has been to your hospital, do you automatically refer them to your own PTs or do, do some of them go to this private PT? They can the choose which physical therapy service to go to. Okay. And um, do you know when you will know whether or not you're going to be buying that practice? Uh, no, this just came up Thursday afternoon, so we're just taking the steps to move forward and we'll be uh, putting a letter to the Greenmount Care Board to outline what steps we might be taking. Uh, similar to the letter that Littleton Regional Hospital sent uh, last week. Okay, great. So the, the second question, and it, was, it really uh, follows up on a question that I asked at one of your peer hospitals earlier today. Um, you started the presentation talking about a crisis in access, and you mentioned that um, psychiatry was number one. We didn't rattle off two, three, and four. Could you, could you do that for me? Uh, I would say from the nurse department perspective, um, uh, most regularly, as I said, not, not in terms of numbers, because our numbers of psychiatric presentations aren't as high as some other disease processes, um, but in terms of uh, percent um, availability of resources, I would say um, psychiatry is number one in lacking. Um, number two and, and three, um, I would say number two is probably critical medical patients. Um, and then uh, three is probably kind of your sub-critical uh, that requires some level that, that we're either full at any rate for the 25 inpatient beds, um, including patient requiring telemetry. Um, so cardiac or some nature. Um, trauma is not on that list. Trauma is almost always accepted, although not always, but almost always. So what uh, possessed me to ask the question of your pure hospital earlier today is to follow up to our visit with you a few months back, and I heard you say cardiac, and um, Dr. Kunin from Copley seemed to, to think that there was no issue as far as cardiac. He said um, when they have somebody at that level, um, they don't seem to have a problem, you know, getting that uh, referral to the tertiary hospital. So it's just conflicting testimony that we're hearing at times, and it's hard to figure out what's the truth and what's the reality and maybe what we'll need to do is try to work with your colleague at Voss and uh, try to get some type of survey out there to see um, you know what others are experiencing so we can get to the bottom of this because we certainly don't want to have an access issue on things like that so I completely agree with you I appreciate you hearing that concern and again when a patient is going not only one state over but two states over to Maine Medical Center three hours away I think that speaks volumes it certainly does. So, Pat, do you have questions? Yes, I do. Um, really, I have a couple of comments and questions. First of all, um, it sounds like this might be Paul Bankston's mm -hmm. last hospital budget hearing, at least as CEO of FBRH. And so, um, I just want to thank you. Um, for where I've sat over the last 30 years or so, um, you seem to be quite an innovator and an early adopter, so thank you very much for your You're service. Um, to follow up on Robin's um, question about the accountable health community, I think it would also help um, the board to know not only how the dollars are being spent, but some ideas if you can give us um, about metrics that, you, that we or you might use that's the admin that you intend to pursue to evaluate um, the success of the accountable health community. So um, it looks like Laurel might have an answer. So um, right now, through the accountable health community, we have what we call a results checklist, and I can always send that to you, where we have some identified metrics. The real quick way to get a sneak peek at them is in our implementation plan, the population level measures are, are they pretty much match up with what we're looking at. And then we use the results-based accountability uh, format. So we're looking at these population health measures, which are typically could take a while to, to see a difference. And they're also the ones that you need lots of collaboration with lots of partners to get to. 
And then within each program or service or each initiative, we also identified the performance level measures, and that's how many people were served, um, you know, how many how many hits you had, how many those those types of things to just kind of look at how you can evaluate the service or initiative. Um, we have whenever we do any kind of evaluation, we have to struggle with, we don't have a lot of academic medical centers and we only have so many people that can do that, but we really think it's very important. We don't want to spend our time on something that's not working. Great. So, does that help you? And, yes. you know, and we kind of see, you know, if, with this alignment with the ACO, you know, they have their quality measures, their population health level, level measures, and we see having to meet those as well. But we'd also like to layer on these true, really more true population health level measures, the real social determinant of health type measures as well, with the with the kind of health community. And I, I can I I can comment on that because uh, there are metrics that we uh, that we use to and will use to measure progress in our uh, five categories of work, which are physical health, mental health. Uh, food security, financial security, and um, safe and secure housing. So, um, and, and there are uh, metrics that we've generated, uh, defined with the UVM Office of uh, Rural Development, basically. Um, and uh, so, I also we also follow um, the uh, University of Wisconsin now the you know county health rankings. Uh, more specifically, and we have uh, projects working uh, uh, right, right now. It's interesting that Robert Wood Johnson people sought us out so that uh, they that they they could work with us on uh, building again, continuing to build systems that uh, raise all boats, so to speak, in our general area, which is again one of the three poorest counties in Vermont. So. Um, that's that's what we're working with. Say, for example, you know, we're we're interested in seeing the number of people who are spending more than 30% of their uh, monthly uh, income on on housing. Housing is uh, affordable housing in our area, even though it's a low income area. Affordable housing is still a real problem. Uh, and those are just, that's just a couple of examples. What I like is to see the agencies working among themselves to solve some of these uh, things. And yes, we're interested in not wasting money. We're interested in controlling expenses. Um, but we'll save more of that for more specific responses. Thank you. Um, following up on the expense um, question, I was wondering if you could give an example of a lean project you mentioned in your um, narrative, some of the efforts you have around lean projects, and if you could just give an example. Sure. Um, so we added a, an inefficient system of registering patients for our laboratory and diagnostic imaging services. Uh, patients had to make several jumps to get registered uh, and then get to the right place and to get the lab drawn, work drawn for example. Uh, so we have a point of service registration person now in the lab so that the patients don't have to jump from office to office uh, to get their, their lab work done, to get registered for and then get their lab work done. Uh, so that much greater patient experience and allowed us to reduce some, uh, some labor costs in the registration. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I just wanted to say that in a short period of time, I've known Paul, I can't picture him riding off into the sunset. <laughs> At this point, we're going to turn the questions over to the healthcare advocate, Julia and Eric. Thank you. Hi, first, I want to thank you, well, first, for hosting us earlier this summer at your hospital, and second, for providing written answers uh, to the questions that we submitted last week that will hopefully get all of us out of here a little bit sooner, so we appreciate that. Um, so I want to start by asking, um, well, as we know, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate uh, represents Vermonters in healthcare policy, um, and we also work with individual Vermonters um, who face problems accessing healthcare. So one of the things that's frequently raised with our office is um, affordability issues, 
um, for accessing healthcare services, whether it's somebody with a uh, high deductible plan or no insurance or someone who's not qualifying for financial assistance programs with their local hospital. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your hospital's experience with affordability challenges and whether or not you agree that affordability is a major concern for our uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm with the third course of Kennedy in, in Vermont, so affordability is, is a challenge for us. We strive to keep you know, our rates as low as we can. Uh, we try to get people qualified for our patient assistance program wherever possible. Uh, and when that's not possible, those patients in between to make a little bit too much to qualify, we have a very generous, interest-free, long-term repayment program for their dental services. Thank you. Um, I can I comment on this. This is an interesting topic, and it's going to be really interesting to watch where this goes, but in meeting with our uh, Health Benefit Exchange uh, Navigator, which uh, which we and she's just outstanding, um, one of the things that we're observing is that uh, when people come in and look at the affordability, even if the plan's on the exchange, they'll, they'll um, uh, they'll, they'll take a look at what, what the cost is uh, for them to buy that benefit plan. Uh, and then they'll match that against what our financial assistance program uh, will provide them if, uh, if they had a medical event and they had to use our services. And some people, interestingly enough, are starting to say, no, I can't afford the X amount of dollars uh, a month on the health benefit exchange plan uh, we'll use your financial benefit program instead. So uh, they find that our financial benefit program is more affordable. Yeah, and I did want to mention we do have two certified navigators for the health exchange. That we work for. So they help people, they are easy. <coughs> they help them sign up for plans and also for Medicaid. Thank you. Um, can you talk about how you assess Vermonters' ability to pay when you're setting your prices? Uh, well, again, we try to keep the prices as low as possible, so I don't know, I can't say we specifically think about people's ability to pay, we think about keeping the prices as low as we can, and, and again, qualifying patients for our assistance program where possible, giving those that don't, don't qualify a long-term plan to be paid. Thank you. Um, so when the board uh, approves a commercial rate for your hospital, do you consider that to be a set rate, or do you see it as like a starting point for negotiations with insurance companies? Um, we see it as a starting point for negotiations with insurance companies. So you are. So it's not a set, and we have, we're negotiating, we have to renegotiate with Blue Cross, for example. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to give you, I know you, you answered in your written responses, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about um, the harm reduction in services for substance users in the community if you're interested in doing so. Uh, sure. So we have quite a few harm. Uh, so we are you talking about needle exchanges? So, so like we, um, what are you talking we, about? Yeah, so I, yeah, oh. I did. Um, <laughs> just have to get the exact wording here. So the first, um, as I said, the easiest one to describe is we provide rent-free space for the Vermont Cares program, the needle exchange program. Uh, so we don't operate the program, but we provide space for those to do, to do so uh, free of charge. Uh, and then we have a nurse practitioner who's uh, all her time is spent on um, uh, harm reduction services. Thank you, harm reduction services. So uh, she's screening patients for hep C and HIV. She's got a number of patients with HIV that she's working with. Um, she's got patients with hep C that she's been able to get the vaccine, uh, get the virus clear from their system. Uh, so again, it's 24 hours a week this person spends just on harm reduction services. Thank you. That's all my questions. Okay, at this time we'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Dale. Um, Speak loudly, Dale. Yeah. Yeah. This room is horrible for hearing it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the woman that first talked. Um, you mean the first Dr. Schwartz? Yeah, her. Her. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they're, they're even in the shadow over there. You can't even see faces or anything. It's just like, there's a shadow, there's a shadow, there's a shadow. Um, do you by chance 
I heard you say you meet each person once, but do you look for things like weight gain caused by the medications, measuring that? Because um, I know that can be a significant issue in terms of side effects. And it's one that actually most people, I was surprised, aren't even aware of unless they're actually taking it, which is weight gain from meds. Right. Um, the second part would be the out-of-pocket expenses clarification on is the problem the out-of-pocket expenses related to an uh, underinsured plan, a bronze plan, or the purchase of a plan that really doesn't do much for you? Or is the problem what's not covered as far as not covered at all, and you've got to absorb the full cost of the whole thing? on top of all the co-pays and everything else. I was just looking for clarification on that. The third one would be, this is an opinion I want to express, I don't think they should be under one care. I think they should be regulated somewhat and given a chance to be, if they want to be, the pilot group for creating change as they want to do and learn from them. The same way Rise for Mom got into One Care because they were creative. I think this group is very creative. And I think they need more ability to express that creativity and I think Vermont will benefit. That definitely has to go down as a pain. Um, so I'll answer the first question and let someone else answer your second question. So the first question was about uh, monitoring weight gain. Obviously, when I see a person one time, I'm not doing the ongoing monitoring. But one of, of, of I consider one of my tasks is helping get established a system where there is an ongoing mental health monitoring going on, both in terms of the improvement in mental health as a result of treatment, but you're absolutely right. There are side effects to some medications that have a standard of care for doing the monitoring. And that can be implemented, particularly, you know, when you have a good, robust electronic medical record for monitoring those uh, parameters on a regular basis. Of course, I always talk about weight gain. People come to me already often having been on medications. I assess what it's a personalized approach. What is their biggest concern about weight gain if they have it? Others say that's not the big deal, I just want to feel better. It's a very personalized approach, but it is a certain, certainly a concern and I do address it and it's factored into my recommendations to the primary care doctor with instructions to monitor specifically for that. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments from the bottom? I'm not sure we answered uh, the second oh, question sorry. about uh, the insurance piece. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I would put there, you know, again, <laughs> it's not everybody. This is a heavily subsidized program, and we're doing it because the population needs it. Uh, we're, you know, that's part of that additional expense without the additional revenue. Correct. <laughs> well, that's about the simplest way I can explain it. Yeah, me too. I agree. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, we'd like to uh, thank the team from Northeast. Paul, I somehow I don't think this will be the last time we see you, but uh, well, you, you never know. I've got a lot of other interests. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like you and everything, but uh, you know, I, 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 I can make a, a couple of proposals. <laughs> Sayonara suckers. <laughs> well, it is interesting because when I came here, um, uh, we're dealing with some of the same issues, and um, uh, many of Vermont's policies disadvantage providers along the Connecticut River. And um, you, you know, I think I heard you use the word coaching one time with respect to 
uh, people marketing to get uh, into each other's markets. We, uh, within the state of Vermont, what I've watched uh, over the years, especially when it comes to uh, healthcare and retail, is that the trade balance between New Hampshire and Vermont has continued to grow, uh, advantage New Hampshire. You know, uh, I, I might actually be interested in getting more involved in economics because, quite frankly, I'm not sure people understand the uh, economic dynamics of uh, healthcare uh, along the New Hampshire border. Uh, I hope I'm wrong about that. But uh, we'll continue to work on that. I love the people who live in our area and our community. Um, we're as interested in as, uh, uh, not overly spending. I frankly, I think uh, to be, um, to uh, Dale's point, I would say, you know, give this hospital a chance. It is not known for wasting money. It's known for being prudent, wise, uh, investing in things that work. Um, and um, it has some considerable headwinds that it has to um, walk, walk into. So uh, personally, in, in my personal interest, uh, uh, I'll probably spend a lot more time looking at uh, issues related to the aging population and people with intellectual challenges. Uh, if I stay, you know, paying attention to that, I've got many other personal interests that make me very happy that have nothing to do with healthcare. <laughs> so with that, we thank you very much for the thank presentation. You. And, uh, yeah. Enjoy the rest of the day.